Hey again, everybody. We've got two classes uh, this week on, on one topic. Uh, we're in the last stages now of our transition from medieval times into uh, early modern times uh, through the Renaissance, the Reformation, the Scientific Revolution, and now the last two classes on what's called the Glorious uh, Revolution. We have one handout in two parts. Uh, the first two pages of this week's handout, you'll, they'll look familiar to you because you've had those two pages before. We're gonna take a second to review uh, England uh, becoming Protestant under Henry VIII and Elizabeth. And then the main part of the handout begins. These are the new pages, Parliament Limits the English uh, Monarchy. Uh, so that's our topic. That's our topic this week. Uh, it's sometimes referred to as chapter three of American history. One would be Columbus, of course. Two would be the Reformation in the English-speaking world. And then three, Parliament Limiting the Monarchy. Uh, all of which have direct carryover uh, 3,000 miles across the ocean to what's happening in English-speaking uh, North America. As always, uh, I want to begin with background. Uh, we know that in art, background serves to highlight and illuminate the foreground in history and law and medicine. It makes whatever the present condition or individual or whatever it is uh, more understandable uh, and easier to get a uh, handle on, whether it's a case or a lecture in history or, or a, a, medical, uh, a medical problem. When I said case, I meant a uh, case before the law. In the widest possible spectrum, uh, the uh, Glorious Revolution has its roots in the uh, Reformation. Uh, the most important thing about the Reformation, as it bears on our topic today, was that in 1517, uh, Luther challenged what was unchallengeable, uh, what was unthinkably unchallengeable, and that was the power of the uh, Roman Catholic Church over faith and religious doctrine and religious practice. Uh, he succeeded in his, in his challenge, uh, probably more than he wanted to, uh, I don't think he meant to split the church. I think he meant to work within uh, the church to reform its ways and bring it back to the condition it was in when it saved civilization. Uh, it didn't turn out that way, uh, as, we, as we know. Uh, a half a generation later, uh, Nicholas Copernicus uh, challenged the ancient Greek and Roman and Christian uh, authorization, so to speak, of the, of the old universe, the universe we thought we lived in from ancient Egypt uh, down to his time. His year was 1543, just a few years after, after, uh, after uh, Luther. Uh, Luther, looking at the two at the same time, uh, Luther proved that if you can challenge the church, the implication is that you can challenge anything. What, what can't be challenged if the church can be successfully challenged? And in that list of things that can be challenged because the church has been questioned uh, is the universe. And Copernicus went out on the same kind of limb uh, that, Luther, uh, that Luther had done. Uh, in the beginning, the scientific revolution was very comparable to Martin uh, Copernicus, was very comparable to Martin Luther. In the end, the scientific revolution, uh, by the time it wrapped up with Isaac Newton, uh, if you could say that the scientific revolution had a home, uh, it, was, it was England, uh, the center of the English-speaking world. Uh, England could claim to be home to the scientific revolution on the basis of what you can think of as a big three. Uh, William, the foundation of the Royal Society, 1660, we talked about it last time. William Harvey uh, revolutionizing the study and treatment of the heart in 1672. And then the biggest punch, the power punch, coming at the end with Isaac Newton in 1680, 1687. 
Now we're going to see uh, that uh, the Glorious Revolution comes to an end, a successful end, in England at about the same time, it, well, within a year, of the scientific revolution coming to a successful end in England. I think those, those are, that's not a coincidence. Uh, those two wrapping up, coming home uh, in England in the, in the 1680s. And, and we'll see how they ran together neck and neck. To tighten the perspective background a little bit, uh, I wanted to go back over the process by which England became uh, Protestant. And that's why we have the two pages starting the handout, start off the handout that you've had that you've had before. Uh, these pages are 431 to 432, uh, and they review the process, or we're going to review the process by which England broke with Rome and became, in name at least, uh, Protestant. Uh, see the word Protestant. See the word protest. Luther's protest was sincere, it came from the heart. He found his evidence for it in scripture. King Henry VIII's protest against the church was entirely selfish. I couldn't, if I'm the king of England, if I can't get my divorce in Rome, then I'm gonna break with Rome and form my own church, a national church, the Church of England, or the Anglican Church here at England, and then I'll write my own ticket. Uh, as far as matters of faith are concerned and as far as my own personal life uh, is concerned, my own married life is, is, is concerned. This is exactly what Henry did, and there was nothing that could stop him uh, being king of England. We know from last time talking about the great chain of being, the lofty position that kings are in. Uh, God being a king, the thinking runs that since God is a king himself, he likes kings. He likes to govern through kings. And to question a king is just about the same thing as to question God. You, you, you just don't do it. Not before this challenge comes home anyway. Uh, and with, with that kind of, uh, with, with, with that kind of feeling out there as far as what monarchy was, what kings were, uh, the king could, King Henry VIII, could do just about what he, he wanted, uh, as could his successors, as we saw. Now, Henry is broken with the Church of, of Rome. He's established a national church, the Church of England. Uh, his 15-year-old son, Edward, took a real sharp Protestant turn and then died at 15. Uh, his daughter, Mary, took a real sharp Catholic turn and then she died. Uh, neither was very successful, and when Elizabeth became sovereign of England, when Elizabeth became queen, she resolved to continue what her father had begun, and that was to further this Church of England with enough Protestantism in it to satisfy Martin Luther's backers and enough Catholicism in it to satisfy uh, the old church, with the exception of members of the Society of Jesus, the, the Jesuit order. Uh, Queen Mary had burned Protestants. Uh, Queen Elizabeth was not at all reluctant to hunt down, torture, and execute uh, Catholic priests in England. But the process goes through so that by the time Elizabeth died in 1603, the Church of England looked set. Uh, looked as if it was on its own way as a main line uh, Christian faith, and it was. When Elizabeth died, and now we get to the new part of the uh, handout, uh, which the, the first page of the second part of the handout is numbered 536. When Elizabeth died, uh, she never married, had no children, uh, and she was succeeded by the nearest, the most nearly direct male heir to the throne, uh, a man who happened at the time to be the King of Scotland. This is James, uh, surname Stuart, S-T-U-A-R-T. Uh, James was king, the sixth king by that name in Scotland. He's gonna become the first king by that name in England. This is King James I from 1603 to 1625. 
we know three things about James. I think most people understand three things about James. Uh, Elizabeth, whom he's succeeding, had executed his mother uh, earlier uh, in uh, uh, his reign for treason. Uh, James was the son of Mary, Queen of Scots, and Elizabeth had put her to death uh, for, uh, uh, for treason. Uh, we also know about uh, King James, that, he, that his was the first voice in the world that I know anything about raised against tobacco. Uh, he led an anti-tobacco crusade. Uh, he thought that he, he called tobacco the stinking, foul weed of the devil, uh, manufactured in heaven, I'm sorry, manufactured in hell uh, to uh, become an affliction. Uh, to those uh, addicted to it. He did everything he could to discourage the use of, of tobacco. We're a long way from cigarettes, but still the use of tobacco was something that he uh, abhorred and tried to discourage. And we know also uh, this about uh, King James uh, the first. He is the King James of the King James Bible, uh, the KJ, the King James Version of the Bible. Uh, a new translation of the Bible in English uh, based on Erasmus' original uh, Greek. Uh, King James Version was published in 16, between 1609 and 1611. A word about Bibles at this point before we go any further. Uh, the first time the Bible was divided into books or chapters had been in England. It was done by Stephen Langton in the 13th century. Uh, Langton also wrote the Magna Carta, which is going to loom very, very large in, in what's uh, fixing to happen here, that, that document that was forced on King John I in 1215, limiting royal power to a certain extent, which he disregarded, and the Pope freed him from uh, having to be in any way obedient to it. But Langton uh, divided the Bible into uh, its, its chapters. Uh, that we recognize today. Uh, in 1516, uh, it was Erasmus, the great Christian humanist, who translated the New Testament into Greek, as close to the original Greek as we'll ever get, uh, and Erasmus cleared the decks for further translations of the Bible, and they're starting to come now, number one, off the printing press, and number two, in vernacular or everyday spoken languages like English and German. The first complete Bible in English uh, was William Tyndale, and Tyndale's version of the Bible, uh, his English language Bible appeared in 16, uh, in, I'm sorry, in 15, in 1525. Uh, Luther's uh, German uh, New Testament uh, came out earlier, a little earlier, in 1622. Uh, the first Bible that we have, number one, off a printing press, number two, in a vernacular language, and number three, divided not only into books, but to chapters and verses, it was a French version, uh, came in 1555. Uh, the first English language version, number one, off the printing press, number two, in English, number three, with chapters, chapter, with books, chapter and verse all numbered as they are today, uh, was produced by English Protestants in Geneva, John Calvin's uh, city, uh, in 1555. And that Bible uh, was called the Puritan Bible or the Geneva Bible. And incidentally, it was the first portable Bible. It was the first Bible that uh, wasn't chained to the altar, so to speak. Well, not so to speak, Bibles were chained uh, to the altar, but the Geneva Bible was a Bible that uh, you could carry, that you could carry with you, the first portable, the first portable Bible. And there was a profusion of all kinds of other Bibles. There were, where all of a sudden, there were Bibles coming out the, the way apples come out of an apple, come off of an apple tree. Uh, and King James wanted to bring that all to a successful conclusion by authorizing a translation of the Bible uh, that would be satisfactory in the English-speaking world to almost all Protestants and almost all Catholics. It 
didn't quite make it that high, but it came very, very close. Uh, we owe the King James Version uh, a lot. It, it's, it's, it's the basis for all modern translations of the uh, Bible, and the English language uh, owes the King James Version a lot as well. Listen to some of the phrases that the translators who put the King James Version of the Bible together, listen to some of the phrases that are new to the English language. Uh, when I heard these, when I hear these phrases, I think of Shakespeare. But no, th these, are, these are phrases from the King James Version, and they show the genius of King James translation. Uh, Phrases like, uh, phrases like these, uh, let there be light. Lead us not into temptation. How the mighty have fallen. Get thee behind me, Satan. Set your own house in order before you turn to setting another's, in ho another's house in order. Fight the good fight. It's a long list, and it indicates the extent to which the English language is in debt to, uh, to uh, the King James Version of the Bible, 16.9 to 16.11. The king wanted the Bible, wanted his Bible, uh, to be very, very supportive of the Church of England. He wanted the Bible to be... Uh, reverential towards kings and queens. He wanted the Christian world to be respectful towards the authority of bishops. Bishops are the, if, if, if God governs through kings, kings governed through bishops. Uh, bishops were spiritual officers and administrative officers. We've talked a lot about bishops before. They're a carryover, they're a Catholic carryover into uh, the Church uh, of England, which Henry insisted on, and which Elizabeth insisted on, and which King James uh, insists on. We will govern the Church, we, when a king says we, he, may, he means God and I. We will govern the Church through uh, the bishops. Now, this is where we begin our story of Parliament limiting the authority of the uh, of the kings the only uh, the greatest objection to the king james version came from those protestants who bitterly opposed royal authority wherever it was uh, these protestants were opposed to royal authority and they were opposed to bishops. In the English-speaking world they were known as Puritans and the name Puritan I think as I told you before comes from their idea that the Church of England is filthy. It is filthy with old Catholic practices and it's filthy with respect to kings and particularly filthy as far as its respect for bishops are concerned, and all of those things have got to go as far as Puritans uh, were concerned. Well, when King James came to the throne in 1603, English Puritans, uh, taking advantage of what John Calvin had said about in certain circumstances God is pleased by rebellions against any kind of Catholic authority. Puritans, a Puritan delegation appeared before the king in 1604 or, or 165 and asked him, and this was, this was rude and impudent, you, you, you don't ask a king a question like this, but they bluntly asked the king, your, your majesty, when, not, not if, when do you plan on removing all of this Catholic dirt from the Church of England and restoring it to, to true scriptural uh, authority. When, Your Majesty, in particular, do you plan on eliminating the office of bishop? Well, 
It took a long time to ask that question. It didn't take the king long to answer it. He answered that very complicated question with a four-word answer. I think it's the best short answer to a long question ever given. And I'll tell you what, what I'll give you the text of the uh, reply. Uh, it goes like this, four words, four words only. No bishop, question mark, comma, no king. And by that, you can understand what the king meant by that if you take the question mark and the comma out and put an equal sign between the two parts of the phrase. No bishop equals no king. James, I think, understood that although they're asking about bishops and they want bishops eliminated, they're ultimately asking about monarchy and want it eliminated. And he went on to say, this is also very famous. He went on to say that you will obey the law of this land or I will drive you from it. And he meant exactly uh, what he said. Those who left England rather than obey the law of that land went to New England, primarily Massachusetts. And they went on, these English Massachusetts Puritans, went on to have a lot to do with the formation of the United States of America. The Puritans who stayed in England rather than leave the country, the Puritans who stayed had much to do with bringing down the English monarchy and establishing a limited or constitutional monarchy. So that, that's, that's not too bad uh, for a uh, religious, uh, religious minority, such as the Puritans were, but they were very, they were, they, they were very, very driven uh, in all of their, uh, in all of their uh, criticism of the king and of the church. Uh, they, they, were, they were willing to undergo martyrdom, uh, and, and you'll see the uses to which they're going to put the power uh, that they have. The attack on the king, King James I, of course ended with, with his date, his death in 1625, uh, but it was picked up and renewed in an even fiercer way against King Charles II, I'm sorry, King Charles I, James I's son. Now, king Charles is going to rule from 1625 until his execution by Parliament, still a young man, in 1649. The attack on Charles came from two directions. It came first from the Puritans, of course, and it came from a new source uh, as well, uh, at least a new source of opposition. It came from the English Parliament. Oftentimes, Puritans were members of Parliament, and that combination is a juggernaut. That combination proves lethal. Parliament objected to the policies of King Charles I in the same way that those feudal aristocrats back in 1215 objected to the policies of King John I and forced him to sign the Magna Carta. Magna Carta did not have the force of law, but it is a source of inspiration uh, to Parliament in the uh, 17th century. What is Parliament? Parliament is a representative body. It's the oldest English-speaking representative body on the planet. It goes goes way, way back. Uh, it's a bicameral or two-house legislature, the upper house or the lords representing old land, the lower house or the commons representing new money, and new money only, not, not the broad mass of the people at all, but only new money and new, new lots of new money. Uh, the very rich are represented in the lower house or the house of commons. 
many Puritans were members of the Commons. And in the spirit of Magna Carta, in the spirit of that slap in the face of King John in 1215, the Puritans presented King Charles in 1628 with a petition. And the petition, the points of the petition are there at the bottom of page, uh, I'm sorry, bottom of page uh, 536, the first page under the heading of Parliament uh, limits uh, the, English, uh, the English monarchy. And those points are pretty clear. Uh, no taxation without representation. No arrest without due cause, no prosecution without due process, no martial law proclaimed by the king without the consent of parliament, and no what was called quartering. Uh, quartering was a situation that arose when to punish a town or a city, or even an individual who had obstructed his power or thought about even obstructing his power, the king would send in a regiment of troops uh, who would be fed and housed by the community itself at, at its own experience, at its own expense. It was, it, was a, it, was a tough, it was a tough weapon, and Parliament spoke out against it in 2016-28 uh, in the Petition of Right. The king, against his will, same as John I signing the Magna Carta, King Charles I, against his will, signed the Petition of Right. Now, it does not have the force of law any more than Magna Carta did. It's a petition. In a petition, you're asking for something. You're not laying down the law in a petition. You're asking for something. And this is what Parliament was asking for in 1628. And just beneath the surface, uh, you know uh, that, or you should know, that Parliament is also asking for a church without bishops, a church without any Protestant I'm sorry, a church without any Catholic carryover at all. And maybe a country without a king. James had kind of understood that. Charles took it as an insult. He should have. From 1628 until 1643, uh, he ruled uh, alone. That is to say, he ruled without the consent of Parliament, without consultation with Parliament. He ruled as if Parliament were not there. And among his policies in this solitary rule was to stamp out Puritanism. And he depended for this on his Archbishop of Canterbury, who else but a bishop, and this is the Archbishop of Canterbury, the number one church man in England, depended on William Laud uh, to stamp out Puritanism in the universities, in the colleges, in the schools, and in daily, uh, daily religious uh, life, and, and Laud was very, made very thorough uh, work of it. So thorough, in fact, that in 1641, Parliament had him arrested and condemned him uh, to death. Uh, the execution didn't occur until 1645. Uh, by that time, by 1645, the worst possible thing uh, had, had happened, and that was that a civil war uh, had broken out in England between forces, between individuals and units of the army uh, loyal to the king. These were called cavaliers, Cavalier from the French word for horse, horseback, aristocrats, cavalry. Uh, those were the kind of people who supported the king with arms. The king's supporters were called roundheads uh, for reasons I'm not, I'm not exactly uh, sure of. Uh, but this is a bitter civil war. Uh, civil wars are the worst of all kinds. And when a civil war is combined with a religious war, uh, it, it, it's a terrible, it's a terrible thing. Uh, the king did not have much chance of uh, winning. 
of the war. Uh, the city of London was against him. I think the broad mass of people across the country were for the king. Uh, but the, the Roundhead armies, uh, led by Oliver Cromwell, uh, were better trained, better armed, better equipped, and on the whole, better led. So much so that by 1649, uh, the fighting was over, uh, the king was a prisoner, uh, and his life was in jeopardy. Uh, we'll follow the rest of this story in class on, on Thursday. We're, we're good.